but was was that just hidden I guess okay All right, so um, just to recap of exactly where we are, uh, we've uh, we spent some time talking about uh, isoparametric elements, as you know last time. The, the idea is that we could possibly use different shape functions uh, to be able to represent the behavior. And the concept was moderately straightforward, although kind of in the details a bit murky. The idea is that we can map things from one geometry, this is the basic essence of it. Uh, we can map things from one geometry where we have these curved sides and also uh, more nodes uh, than we've had in the past. So you could use, for instance, instead of this linear varying shape functions, we could use quadratically uh, varying shape functions. And if we do that, we merely map from this complicated geometry onto a very basic geometry, where we have to do a couple of different things. Come in. Um, and that is that we want to be able to figure out exactly what this A matrix is and what this mapping component is. Yeah, we put new batteries in, and that didn't seem to help. I didn't know whether there's something on the console here that was. I think it might be the cable. Maybe this as well. I, I missed. I thought this volume here might be something that. that so maybe it's this the reason for the feedback is. Right now, maybe it's this. This was down below. I turned it back down. It was up. So. Good you have spare parts. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, well. Okay. I'll be able to magically edit this file to be able to take care of that. That's good. So, um, so we talked about so we talked about the, the mapping that we'd be able to do to go from this geometry to this geometry. And there are a couple of things we needed to do. We need to figure out what these matrices are in terms of the local coordinates. So we needed to figure out A as a function of R and S coordinates, not X and Y. It's not as a function of x and y. And we also had to figure out what this mapping component was. And if we could do that, we found out that we could do it because basically, or at least the one dimensional problem, this Jacobian, <coughs> pardon me, this Jacobian is merely equal to uh, the ratio of the lengths in the uh, undeformed, the real case and the mapped case, just the ratio of those lengths in, in some way. If it was in two dimensions, we didn't talk about that yet, but we will talk about that. And so the things that we have to do are one, integrate on this irregular, on this now regular geometry, which is mapped, and also calculate the magnitudes of the A and the J, A and the J matrices. And so it's not always convenient to be able to do this integration analytically. 
uh, sometimes we have to actually use numerical integration. So we'll talk about the ways of being able to figure out the magnitudes of these elements. So we'd like to talk about numerical integration as a method of being able to do this. And then we'll talk about the extension. We'll do an example with a one-dimensional element. And then we'll talk about how we extend it then to two, to two dimensions. And we perhaps don't want to spend as much time on 2D and 3D as, as otherwise, uh, just because I think it gets complicated. So numerical integration. The idea here is that we want to be able to calculate these maybe uh, non-constant matrices, which aren't straightforward to integrate anymore. And so the one way to do that is to use numerical integration. And so just to, you probably have come across this before. It's the same as uh, Simpson's rule in terms of being able to uh, sample a portion of a distribution. So the idea, I think, is that if you want to, if you have some curve uh, in terms of R and uh, some function of R, and say this curve looks like this, and say this is minus 1 to plus 1. And then clearly the integration of this function is the area underneath this curve. And so one way to do that would be to choose to uh, represent this and divide it into a whole series of blocks in which case you can take the magnitude of the midpoint of each of these curves, multiply it by the thickness. This is f as a function of r. Multiply it by the thickness of each one of these blocks, which would be dr. And if we just sum up all of these individual slices, you end up with the area under the curve. And that's exactly what this expression is, right? This, this integral is just the error under the curve. So numerical integration does that in this way, and that would be Simpson's rule, uh, which has a certain order of accuracy. Uh, but the other way to do it, which is somewhat more simple, uh, is to use uh, numerical integration tables, which instead of individually you dividing it up into these individual sections, you do something slightly, uh, slightly different. And what you do that's slightly different, um, we probably want to keep this open, but I'm going to draw here, is that instead of doing, making these slices, we choose a couple of points to be able to calculate the magnitude of the integral. And so the same result we could get by doing this, by going between minus 1 and plus 1, having a function that goes between them, we want to end up with the area under this curve, which of course is this integral. I didn't mean to underline it, so maybe the area. And so what you could do is you could choose a point here, one point, calculate what the magnitude of the function is, and you draw a straight line across here, and you multiply the value of this function of r, again this is a function of r, and you just multiply the area is just equal to the function of r, evaluated at say 0, because this point here would be 0, and multiplied by 2, which is the length of this, right? And so some approximation of the area under this function, this integral, is just by choosing a value, drawing a straight line across that, hoping that there's enough of this curve above it as there is below it, so it's roughly the average of it. And this gives you an approximation, I guess, of this integ integral. And so it is an approximation because you see it's not exactly fitting the behavior. If you use more points to do that, you get a more accurate result. And so what numerical... Uh, integration does, or quadrature, sometimes this is referred to as quadrature, e. I'll just put it in quotes, uh, 
that's a, an E at the end of it. Not sure. So what quadrature does is it says that if this function is actually a polynomial, so if it's a, a flat line, then it has zero order. If it's a, a straight line, it has first order. If it's a quadratic or a cubic, then what you can do is you can choose the number of sampling points that you take on this curve, and that will give you the exact magnitude of this integral, uh, inclusive, uh, you know, exclusive of, of rounding error. And so it's useful for us to read this station. So quadrature gives the exact magnitude of this integral if the degree of the function k is less than or equal to 2n minus 1, where n is the order of integration. So what does that mean? It means that if it's a, uh, if you want to, for instance, calculate the exact magnitude of a curve, which is a linear curve, so what's the degree of the function? So linear, the degree k is equal to 1. And so then if we want to get the exact magnitude of that curve, we would use uh, a quadrature at least of 1, right? So if you use quadrature of n equals 1, then 2 times n minus 1, n is equal to 1, so that says 2 minus 1 is equal to so if we use a quadrature of 1, then, or, or, a, yeah, or an order of 1, we end up being able to exactly calculate the magnitude of this. And so what that means is if you use an order of integration of 1, it means you use one point. You take the middle point here, you would calculate the function at this point, and you know that this amount here is exactly the same as this amount here. And so you underestimate it by the same amount as you overestimate it, and you realize just by inspection that you'd get the exact magnitude of that um, integration just by taking the midpoint value and multiplying it by this length. So that's really what we're saying here. If you have a function which is quadratic, so this is um, r equals... Uh, so in other words, this would be f equals m times r plus c, right? mx plus c, just the equation of a straight line. If we had a curve which was, instead of a straight line, was a curve, and uh, so the equation of this would be the function would be uh, a1 Let's call it A0, just write it exactly the same as this. A1 plus a constant times R to the power 1 plus a constant times R squared. So this is a quadratic. So in this particular case, the function order K is equal to 2. And so to be able to exactly calculate the magnitude of that, we let's choose n equals 2, and see if that works. So if n equals 2, then this parameter here, 2 times n minus 1, is equal to what? 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is equal to 3. And so this magnitude here is greater than this order here, and so this would be enough to be able to do exactly the integration. And so what this is saying is that if you now choose Two, two points where you evaluate this, say here and here. Let me do it differently. Let me divide this down the middle. Let's choose a point here, which is where we calculate this. Let's choose a point here where we evaluate this. And this length here is 1. And this length here is 1. And so in other words, if you take this height here and multiply it by its width, and take this height here and multiply it by its width, then this would be order 2 
integration that we're using in this case. And so all we have to figure out now is where we choose the point that we'd actually sample this curve to be able to get the exact result. So quadrature is just that. And so you can see also that if you chose, for instance, an order of quadrature equal to 1, that calculation here is 2 times n minus 1, whoops, minus 1 is equal to what? 2 times 1 is uh, 2 minus 1, this is equal to 1. And so this order is less than this, and so you, we wouldn't get an ex exact result. And so if you, took, if you took the midpoint here and tried to do the calculation for this, there would be some error involved. And so quadrature is just a formalism of being able to do that. And so what it relies on us to do is to be able to take uh, this table. And this table is a way of being able to calculate these integrals uh, in a straightforward way. First order quadrature is where n is equal to 1. And what these two uh, tables are saying are where you sample the curve and what weight you multiply the value of the function that you get by. And this is the same as our first one here, right? Order, order 1, n equals 1, which is here. Oops. We took the magnitude of the function in the middle of the curve. We sampled at 0. This is plus 1. This is minus 1. So we sampled the function at 0. We figured out what that magnitude was. And we multiplied the value we got by the length of this zone, which is 2. So that's really all we're doing. If we're choosing two points, which is what we just did now, this is saying that we calculate the magnitude of the function at um, r equals plus 0 0.577, and we multiply it by a length of 1. So in other words, this point here that we've sampled is equal to 0 0.5. 7, 7. We calculate what the function is at this point, we get this height, and then we multiply it by a magnitude of 1, which is the width, and then we go back and we calculate the function at minus 0 0.577, and we do exactly the same, multiply by 1. So in other words, these sampling points are actually defined on this curve, that this is oops, minus 0.577. So that's it. Nothing more than that. And so what it allows us to do is to exactly calculate the magnitudes of these integrals so long as we know what the functions are and we use a high enough quadrature. Uh, clearly, if you use a higher quadrature with more sampling points, you'll get a more accurate result. But what this part here is saying is that um, if the sampling is high enough for the particular variation of the function, the order of the function, then actually you're just wasting time by using more points. You don't get a more accurate result. Uh, you get as an accurate as the other result, but you're actually wasting your time by doing the calculation. And so at the bottom here, this is just a, an example for doing this. So if you have a function which is r squared, so what does r squared look like um, between this? Okay, so it would look like this, wouldn't it? Between plus 1, this is r, this is minus 1. Uh, r squared equals 0 at 0. It equals 1 at, um, this would equal to 1. And since it's a minus 1 squared, it's also positive, so it's symmetric. So this is what r squared looks like. And I suppose the integral would be this area here. And so we can calculate exactly what that is. We can do it in analytically in this case, but we can also do it by quadrature. So uh, what do we notice about this? Well, one, it's a quadratic function, right? r squared. This was a quadratic function. This was the highest order. And we already figured out that we had to use at least second-order quadrature to get the right result. If we used first-order quadrature, we wouldn't get the exact result. In fact, in this case, we'd get a terrible result. 
So let's use quadrature to do it. So what do we do? So uh, one, one point quadrature is this. We sample the curve at r equals 0, find out what the function is, and multiply by 2. So we sample the curve at r equals 0. The value of this is equal to 0, right? r squared at r equals 0 gives 0. And we multiply it by the weight, which is 2, and we end up with 0. Not a very good result. Uh, well, I guess we could integrate it analytically, right? So what, what is it? It's uh, going to be uh, the integral r squared dr is equal to third r cubed with the substitution of minus 1 and plus 1. And so what is that? Uh, so plus 1 would be a third. Uh, minus 1 squared would be another third. So I guess it's 2 over 3, which is equal to 0 0.66. So that's the solution. So this isn't anywhere close to that, right? It's not, not even. It's inexact. If we do it with 2, we know that we should use it for 2 because we did this calculation over here. So to do it for 2 points, we need to be able to sample it at each of these locations, plus and minus 0.577, multiply by the width, and so that's exactly what we have here. So what is that? So um, 0 0.577 squared, which is we do the math, but uh, we squared on this, I guess it is, oh, 0.33, I guess I, it was on that sheet already, I just didn't believe it. So this is 0.33, so 0.577 squared is equal to 0.33, which is this. Multiply it by the weight, which is 1, and that gives this amount, which is obviously 0 0.33. And if you do it for the other location, for minus 0.577 squared is obviously plus 0.33 as well, and the, the two added together is 0.66. We could do the same for n equals 3, but we've already got the exact result, right? So. If you want to, you can do. You can imagine. And so the protocol for that would be now just to make the case. So now you have uh, weights for zero. Uh, you'd calculate the magnitude at plus 0.777 squared multiplied by this length. gives you one value. You calculate it at minus 0.77459 squared times this value again. And then you calculate it as 0, r squared, multiplied by this weight. And you add the three together, and you'd find out, I think, true to form, that you'd end up with a magnitude which would be equal to, to this. You can calculate it yourself. And so the point is that we can calculate these integrals relatively straightforwardly just by using integration. And so the integrals that we want to be able to evaluate that are part of this calculation uh, I guess I'm jumping around. We can we can do uh, with this way. The um, we know also that the expression we have to evaluate is also defined uh, universally in whatever dimensionality we want. So we know that the conductance matrix that we want to get hold of is this value of between minus one and plus one and minus 1 and plus 1. This relationship here. Uh, this scaling parameter. And these local coordinates. And so what we've done so far is we've done it for the case where we have one-dimensional behavior. If we actually want to do it in two dimensions, then the same uh, idea holds is that we need to calculate exactly what this matrix relationship is at any point. Um, we can think about exactly what that would look like. Uh, what, 
what size matrix would this be that we get from looking at this? We know, for instance, that if we have a four-noded element that has nodes at each of these points, then we'd have a matrix. Well, we haven't said anything about what this, this term is yet. Um, well, we know this is a scalar value. So I shouldn't have underlined that because it's actually a, I guess it is, yeah, it, it is underlined. So this is just a scalar value that multiplies uh, this whole thing. Uh, what are the magnitudes of the A matrix? Well, the A matrix links uh, heads at a point being equal to nodal values of heads at the nodes. So this has to be in terms of rows and columns. This has to be four rows by one column for this particular case. And so the values that we have of head gradient, uh, sorry, this is head gradients, isn't it? And so the values of these are gradients of heads in X and gradients of heads in Y. And so by definition, this A matrix has to be, uh, in terms of rows and columns, it has to be 2 by 4. And so when you multiply uh, these two together, you end up with um, a 2 by 4 uh, matrix as well. And then when you multiply by this, this is a 2 by 2 matrix. And this is a uh, 4 rows and 2 columns in this. And so when you multiply across with these components here, the, this, this matrix, overall matrix here, is going to be 4 by 4. I guess I didn't show that so well, but Maybe you take one trust that that's the case. But that's not, I guess that's not the major point that we want to make here. The major point is that we knew that when we did integration along a line, that when we took the shape of this curve, whatever this quadratic function was, between plus 1 and minus 1, then all that we did was we sampled at some location which was 0.577, to find out the magnitude of this, this height, and then we multiplied by this weight, which we called uh, h, I think, right? I think in these curves, yeah. The weight, uh, the width of it is h, which is either, for the two-point two quadrature case, was this magnitude here. And so really all we're doing is we're calculating at each of these Gauss points, so-called Gauss points, this is minus 0 0.577. And so here, again, we had, a, if I can do a dotted line across here, and we multiply the calculated height by the width. That's what we're doing. So physically, it's a relatively simple thing we're doing. So if you want to calculate the behavior uh, on a two-dimensional element, then the exact equivalence of that is that in the plan view of this element, we want to be able to calculate whatever this function is, and there'll be four by four entries of this function. We want to evaluate this function exactly at these Gauss points. And so we'll calculate it at the Gauss points. The, mag the location of the Gauss point will be plus 0.577 in from the center, plus 0.577 up from the center, and this will be the point where we'll evaluate it. There'll be a function. If you calculate what the magnitude of the function is and draw that as a stick of some height, and I'm not going to be able to draw this very well, but if you calculate exactly what the... If you multiply that height of this thing by the area that's underneath it, that prism, if you like, is the magnitude of that integral. You do it for this point, and then you do it for this point, and then you do it for this point, and you do it at this point, you add the four of them together, and that's your integral. So it's a direct um, 
progression, if you like, of taking the one-dimensional case where you calculate a height and a width, multiply the two together, and you get an area, a height and a width, and you get an area. Here you calculate a height and a width times a width. So in other words, this is the function that you calculate the height of. You multiply by a tributary area, which in this case is equal to whatever that number was. It was equal to, to 1 in this particular. Yeah, of course it's equal to 1. And so this would be equal to um, 1. And this would be equal to 1. In other words, it's just the base area of this. And that gives you your, your integral. It gives you the volume of the prism. It gives you it for one point. And then if you repeat it for each of these four Gauss points, so in our particular case, n was equal to 2. So you do it for this point and this point. That gives you one of these two. And then you repeat it for this point and this point. And those give you the, the magnitudes. So if you do it at higher um, uh, sampling, so in other words, if you do it for three individual points, then again, the sampling is at plus and minus 0 0.774 and at zero. And so the equivalent for doing that in two dimensions is this arrangement here. This is at zero. This is at 0.744. And, you, uh, and so you now do, if you think about this drawn out just in plan view, then you do it at... these three locations. What is this? This is point 0.774. And you do it for these locations here. This is plus 0.774. This would be minus 0.774. And so you would calculate what the magnitude of the property is at this particular point here, plus and plus point r, uh, r equals uh, 0.774, s equals 0.774, and you'd multiply it by, oops, behind I guess, by the appropriate area, which would be this one, 0 0.55 recurring. And so. Oops. So in other words, once you've calculated at this point, you're really drawing a box around it, and that box, the size of that box, is equal to 0.555 and by 0 0.555. So that's that's all it is. And so we can implement that relatively straightforwardly. If you want to use uh, four-point quadrature in two dimensions, then it's just this lattice of uh, four by four or 16 points. But the concept's relatively uh, straightforward. So the idea is that if the function is a, a polynomial, uh, so it's either uh, zeroth order, which is a straight flat line, it's uh, linear, which is a straight line, it's quadratic, which is r squared, it's cubic, which is r cubed, or it's um, quintic, which is r to the fifth, then because it's a quadratic, these sampling points turn out to be the optimal locations to calculate the function. And these are the optimal magnitudes of the, the tributary areas around them that you multiply it to get the magnitude of that integral. So that's it. And so it's no, no more involved in that. It's a bit uh, tricky in its implementation, but that's basically the idea. And so, so long as we can calculate the magnitude of this conductance matrix, then we can certainly evaluate the individual values just by calculating a point and multiplying by a tributary area. If we do that, um, then we can also say something about the. we don't necessarily know what the order of integration is that we should apply to this. And the reason is that when we look at the value of this matrix, A transpose dA times this, 
then we need to know exactly what kind of polynomial this conforms to. So if we knew that this, this was a function of r squared, then we'd know that if we use two-point quadrature, then we get the exact solution. But um, you might remember from this morning that when we talked about, the, for instance, the de determinant of the Jacobian, what is that? It's uh, dx is equal to the determinant of the Jacobian times dr. And so by inference, uh, this is equal to dx over dr. Um, so that actually, if we know what the, quad the order of integration of the uh, x is, so in other words, we'll define the location x as a function of the shape functions and the values of the coordinates. So if we know what the shape function looks like, whether it's a linear shape function or a quadratic shape function, then we probably know what the order of this quad uh, this the polynomial is in the determinant of Jacobian. However, when we talk about the order of integration in the A matrix, we know, for instance, that the A matrix is equal to what? It maps it over. The A matrix maps magnitudes of head with, say, location from the magnitudes of the um, nodal heads. And you remember what we did with this was that we want to be able to define this in terms of the local uh, coordinates. And so we could rewrite this dh dx and just multiply by 1, which is what we did before. And if that's the case, then it's fine. So if we make the substitutions, uh, in this we would use the fact that heads are equal to nodal values of heads multiplied by shape function. We know whether the shape function is linear or quadratic because we'll choose that. And we'll also know that the length is equal to, again, the shape function multiplied by the nodal values uh, of the coordinates. But this now is, uh, so dr, yeah, taking a long time to make the point I want to, to make, this is equal to dx dr, 1 over, right, minus 1. This is, just makes sense. So if we substitute this in here, we certainly know the order of this polynomial now, but by substituting into this and taking the reciprocal of it, then we're not able to, I guess the point I'm trying to make is we don't necessarily know the direct order of this uh, matrix equation because the A matrices include a term that is 1 over the polynomial, which makes it not well defined. And so we don't know exactly what the order of um, quadrature is that we have to use, but Roughly, uh, if we use linear um, shape functions for this four-noted element, then we can get by by just doing two-by-two two quadrature. So sampling at these two points, which are uh, plus and minus 0 0.577, etc. If we distort it, in which case the, the magnitude of this um, function is varying much more. So in other words, this function here will not be the same at each of these Gauss points, which are now distorted. And so we still get away with using two-point quadrature reasonably well. If we want to be able to represent an element with, instead of these four nodes, with four corner nodes, but now two mid-side nodes as well, then to be able to guarantee that a function goes through these, we can, we can draw it out in, in one dimension. If we wanted to look at, for instance, uh, plotting the magnitude of head as you go across this portion of the curve uh, and make sure that we're able to go through each of those points, then if you have three magnitudes of heads 
you can't go through that with a straight line. So it has to be at least a quadru quadratic to be able to do that. And so this has to be at least uh, r squared. And if this is r squared, then uh, to be able to, to get this, we, we can show that we need to be able to use typically 3 by 3 quadrature to be able to do that. And so you could say before that when we did r squared, we saw that we could get it quite well just by using 2 by 2 quadrature. But it turns out um, because we have a product of uh, r, uh, you know, we'll have r in here and r in here, and we'll have a value of a, a quadratic as 1 over for these as well, in this term here, that we can't define it exactly. But if we use 3 by 3 quadrature, we get a reasonable result. If it's distorted, we still get a reasonable result with 3 by 3 quadrature. And if we use elements that have not just four corner nodes, four mid-side nodes, but also a central node, then we can also get it with the same same order of quadrature system. Okay, so, so that's probably enough talking about in integration. Um, I won't talk about that because that's too complicated. Uh, will I do that? Let's do something else first. Let's just uh, do an example just to make sure that we understand how to do it. If there is an example in here. Maybe there is an example. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess the example is in two dimensions. All right, well, let's look at this in two dimensions then. Um, I guess the example is actually for an isoparametric element doing the weighting functions for a mass matrix, uh, not for this. Okay. So, so how does this look then if we look at a two-dimensional case? Uh, let's see if we can do this uh, in the time we have available. So these are the matrices that we want to be able to define. This is the map matrix which we want to be able to do. So that we have two tasks that we have to, to get hold of. One is we want to be able to figure out what this mapping matrix is for nodal values of head to gradients of head. And the second one is this geometric mapping factor. We can use uh, shape functions that define this. Uh, we can, they're sometimes referred to as uh, serendipity shape functions. Shape functions. Serendipity just means uh, luck, chosen by, by luck in some respects. Uh, and you remember our requirement for shape functions. I don't know, is, is there a figure? Yeah, there is a figure. So the requirement for shape functions was that they had to equal 1 at the node in question and 0 everywhere else. And so if you look at each of these, um, so this is B1, this is B2, this is B3, and this is B4. And we can check that that's the case. So B1, in terms of our nodal numbering, again, we number counterclockwise. 1, 2, 3, and 4. The, X, the R and S coordinates of node 1 are 1 and 1. And so 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, times 1 plus 1 times 2 is 4. 4 divided by 4 is equal to so the, indeed, this magnitude of the shape function is 1 at this point, no question. If you look at the value at another point, uh, 1 minus 1. So this, I guess this is r, right? r is the first number. Uh, 1 minus 1 is 0. So this is going to be 0 at this point. If we calculate what it is here, it's going to be uh, 1 minus 1, which is 0 times 0, which is also 0. So at all the other points, indeed, the shape function b1 is going to be equal to 0. And if we were to plot exactly what it looked like between those, it would be um, linear along this boundary here. Uh, I, I guess it's going to look quite close to this figure that we looked at yesterday afternoon, uh, which we have drawn out, which I don't need to draw out again. It's going to look very similar to this. So this is... Think of this as B1. This is equal to 1 at the node in question. It equals 0 at the other nodes that we looked at. And if you look at the form of the function, it'll be linear along this side. It'll be linear along this side. And it'll be a little 
different from that in the in the interior, but it would be essentially that would be its behavior. And so this this is what the shape functions will look like that are drawn out that way. And so this is a realization of that. Okay. back right and we can do that for the other other uh, location as well but that's not don't need to so what did we do we said that we can use the uh, shape functions to map two things we can use and that's we can define the heads at each of the nodes at nodes one two three and four we can define the coordinates at nodes one two three and four x coordinates and the y coordinates and we can map them, just as you did before. The head at any point within the element is equal to the nodal values of heads multiplied by whatever the shape function values are at that particular point. So all this is saying that if we want to calculate what the head is at this particular location, we need to calculate the r and the s coordinates for this point. We can use those r and s coordinates to calculate the shape function in terms of b1, b2, b3, and b4. Those will be single numbered values because we'll have values for r and s for each of those points. And if we have single values of r and s, we'll have an individual value for each of these. We multiply uh, the magnitudes of b1 times h1 plus b2 times h2, plus b3 times h3, plus b4 times h4, which is all this expression is saying. And that gives us the magnitude of the head at that particular point. That's physically all it's saying. So if you understand that concept, I think you get a, a feel for what's going on. And so all these allow us to be able to calculate at every single point in the element what the head is, what the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate are as a function of the nodal values of these parameters and also the, the shape functions. So that's all. So what's the next step? Um, we want to be able to... We know that the matrix that we want to get, which is the A matrix, in shorthand links the gradients of head in the global directions as a function of the nodal values of heads in this matrix. So this is what we want to figure out. But we know that we can only really get this by doing this little trick that we've done a couple of times, that we multiply dh dx by 1. Right? This, is, this is 1, dr dr. And so we can, we can easily get this gradient of pressures, heads within the system in the local coordinates. And we can also get this transformation in terms of the stretching and the, the compression of the element according to the Jacobian. And so this is the split that we use. And so what we want to be able to do is get this part here first. So let's do that as a function. It's quite straightforward. If we want to know what the head changes with R and S are, we just take the, the shape function these magnitudes together give us what? These give us h, right? Just from this. And so if we take the derivative of h with respect to r, that's exactly what this is. If we take the derivative of h with respect to s, that's exactly what this is. And so we can define this matrix here, which is just taking the derivatives of the shape functions. So p is just this portion here. If we substitute for the shape functions, which we know, we have the top of the page, we have the magnitudes of those shape functions in equation one. And so we can substitute these into, uh, into here. So we know what they, these are. And so we can put them here and here, basically. That's not x, that's just the point. And we get this. We take the derivatives of them. And so if we're taking the derivatives with respect to r, what would that be? This differentiated with respect to r, well, we lose this term here. r becomes 1, and it becomes 1 plus s 
minus 1 plus s, minus 1 minus s, and plus 1 minus s. So those are these terms that are on the top of this. And if we differentiate it with respect to s, we end up with a, a similar, a slightly different array, but, but similar idea. So we're able to get the magnitudes of this P matrix straightforwardly, which is exactly what this is. And that allows us to get the magnitudes of our uh, local gradients of head in terms of this local coordinate system. So the other thing that we can also do then is uh, we can try now to figure out exactly how we map this onto the, the global system. And so how do we do that? Well, one thing we could do, and it, it's what we've already done, is well, we're doing the reverse of this. We know that dh dr we can get as of just by doing this, multiplying by 1 again. But now this 1 is x, say. Um, and so if we have this, which we do, and we want to be able to get the magnitude of the global uh, gradients, which is really what we want, then we could use this transformation to do this. We could also do this in terms of um, adding another term to this, and again writing this out, which is dhdr. And if we do this now, it looks like we're going to get two times that, right? Because we've written this out twice. We've got dhdr and dhdr. But if we do the evaluations which are uh, perpendicular to each other, then they don't have any relative influence on each other. And if that's the case, then in, in this case, perpendicular to x would be y. So this, again, on the leading diagonal is just 1. And if you look at this expression here, that's exactly what we have here. It's the chain rule. Um, and so just a rationalization of the chain rule. And so if we do that for the gradient in the r direction, if we do it also for the gradient in the x direction by doing the same um, manipulation, then what we can do is we realize the property that we want to pick out of here are these global gradients. Let me put a, a box around them. We want to be able to figure out this. We want to be able to figure out, oh, sorry. We want to be able to figure out this, the global gradients. We want to be able to figure out this. We want to be able to figure out this and this. And so what we can do is we can just write this in a slightly different way as a, as a matrix where we have local, gradients, global gradients, and uh, a mapping function. Right? These are just functions of the geometry, the element, between the global geometry and the local geometry. And so we can figure those out. And the reason that we're doing this is that you remember we want to calculate what the gradients of head are. Let me do it a bit further over. The reason we're doing it is we want to calculate what the gradients of head are with respect to x and the gradients of head are with respect to y as a function of the nodal heads because if we can calculate what these are and we can limp, pull out the values of the heads then de facto we have the magnitude of this A matrix which is what we're after. And so what we can do is we want this backwards. Uh, we can calculate these easily, but we can't calculate these easily. And so what we could do is if we calculate these easily, then we could use that information to be able to figure out exactly what these global gradients are. And so what we can do is we can invert this relationship, which is just, if we write it in shorthand, this is our, we said before that the definition of a Jacobian
Yes, after Jacob, the mathematician. Or Jacobi, not Jacob. Um, the definition of a Jacobian matrix is just, it's a matrix of first-order partial derivatives, which indeed this is. And what we can do is we can define this, that maps it. And since we know what the left hand is, we can get that quite easily, but we want to know exactly what the right hand is, we can just invert this and take the inverse of it. So we switch this around by multiplying both sides by j minus 1 and by j inverse. j minus 1 times j minus 1 is the identity matrix, which just gives us nothing. And so in other words, we can get this matrix here as a function of the inverse of this. Um, and what else? Uh, we also know that this matrix of local derivatives is also given by something that we talked about. Oops, I should move it up here. Um, this. We know that these local derivatives are just equal to P times H. So this P matrix we have, I think. So that's where that comes from. And uh, what else? Well, the, the inverse of this matrix is just going to be uh, the inverse of these terms. So what's the inverse of a, a two by two matrix? Uh, you take, I think, the uh, terms on the diagonal and you switch this one goes here this one goes here, and these become the negative of what they were. So these, these two are switched. So dy ds goes up here, dx dr goes down here. The off-diagonal terms just become the negative, and you divide through by the determinant of the, of the matrix itself. So this is the determinant of the Jacobian. And the determinant of the Jacobian is just uh, this term times this term minus this term times this term. Kind of a standard uh, matrix result. And so it's kind of complicated, and there are lot, lots of steps here, but uh, it's a little confusing maybe. But now we have all the components we need to be able to do this. We know that we can get this P matrix, which is in terms of local behavior. We know that we can get the inverse of this Jacobian, which is just a function of these partial derivatives and the determine the Jacobian. And uh, so we, we can get both of these components. And if we can get both of these components, since the product of these two matrices link the values of heads to the global derivatives of heads, then by definition this is the A matrix. And so, uh, so we have all the components that we need. Uh, and so we can put those final components together. And so the A matrix is just given by these two together. And finally, the, the other matrix we need is this constitutive matrix to be able to define behavior. And with those, we have enough to be able to assemble this. So I guess the, to summarize, we've gone through a long uh, multiple steps. We were able to get this A matrix. What are the components of this? P is equal to the derivatives of the shape functions, I think. So P is just these derivatives of the shape functions. So it's a function of so P is a function of shape functions only. The J minus one is this Jacobian matrix. And what are these terms here? They're kind of ratios of the lengths. Uh, so you can think of dy and ds as the ratios of the lengths in the global matrix to the map matrix. And so they're just numbers, which are the ratios of, if it's a really big real matrix that shrinks down onto a 2 by 2 matrix, then dy, ds is going to be a big number. If it's a really small element, rather, that gets stretched out to be a 2 by 2 matrix, then it would be the opposite. This would be small and this would be large. And so this is just a function of, if you like, the stretching, I suppose. The stretching from one mat, from virgin matrix, if you like, to the, to the mat matrix. 
And so if we're able to calculate those, we can actually then do the integration. We can't take this relationship outside the integration anymore. We just have to do it. But the idea is that at each point within the, the element, we should be able to calculate the value of this, the magnitude of this particular term. If we can calculate the magnitude of that term at each of the Gauss points, in other words, we can calculate it at each of these individual points here, then here, then here, then here, multiply them each by the tributary areas and add them together. And that's our ultimately our uh, uh, matrix that we want to get a, get a hold of. Um, and so I guess we probably could do, uh, yeah, so. Uh, we could look at what those matrices would look like in some instances. I think it's probably instructive to do that. Um, if we have time, we do have time. We have five minutes. So for instance, um, what are the magnitudes of the terms that go into this? Two of these matrices are this um, Jacobian matrix, which we've defined here, dx, dr, and the determinant of the Jacobian. So what, what are the magnitudes of those matrices if we, if we look at them? So if we take, for instance, an example, if we have some space, If we have, for instance, a global matrix, which in terms of x and y, which is 2 on edge and 2 on edge. So this is uh, our global matrix. And if we have this mapped ma uh, element, I keep on saying matrix, I mean element, which is uh, plus 1, minus 1. And so this is also 2 by 2. What are the magnitudes of the, the matrices we have? Well, the Jacobian matrix that we have is equal to, let's go back and see what it is. That's the inverse of it. It's dx dr dy dr. And I'll look at the other terms as well, just so I get them right. And dx ds dy ds again. So what is the magnitude of the Jacobian for this particular case? I'll just do it. If we had linear shape functions, uh, this is absolutely correct. You have to take it on trust from me. So what are the magnitudes of this Jacobian? It has four terms. dx and dr are and x directly aligned. The length of the element in x is 2. The length in r is 2. So this is 2 over 2. It's 1. dy ds. y is in this direction. Length of the element is 2. Height of the element in the map form is 2. So this is 2. 2 over 2, rather, which is 1. The length of the element in y, in this direction, what's the component of this relative to the length of the element in this? Well, they're orthogonal to each other. So the component of x in the... So again, the component of x in the uh, no, the component of y in the r direction. I guess we're looking at this term here, right? So the component of y on the, the global axis relative to s uh, r on the local axis, they're orthogonal to each other. So the value of the length relative to each other has to be zero. Likewise, the component of x, which is in this direction, relative to uh, s, which is in this direction, they're orthogonal to each other, so this is 0. So if the elements are 1 to 1 and aligned in exactly the same way, then this Jacobian matrix is going to be equal to just the identity matrix. It's going to be 1, 1. 
if the global element is say uh, four by four, then what happens then? Then uh, x is four, this would just end up being double the length. So this would be two by two. So it really just says something about the scaling between these uh, two systems. That's really what this uh, Jacobian does. It says something about the scaling between the, the or length scales oriented uh, within the element. And what about the determinant of the Jacobian? Um, which is, well, I guess it's this, right? So the determinant of the Jacobian is this, which by definition is going to be this times this minus this times this. So it's dx dr times dy ds minus dy dr dy dx ds, right? So uh, we've already calculated these terms. So what would they look like if we just use the magnitudes? dx dr we already said is equal to one. Uh, dy ds um, is this one here, which is also equal to one. And these terms I think will be zero. dy dr is zero times zero, which is equal to one. And so physically this is saying that uh, actually it comes back exactly to a, a figure we looked at this morning uh, when we talked about this mapping, and that's exactly what's going on here. So what's going on here is we're looking at an area in the global system, an area in the mapped system. If these areas are, are equivalent as you go from one to the other, then this determinant of the Jacobian is equal to one. It says it's a one-to-one -one area mapping. If uh, this element on the left hand side was twice the size of this. So if this was 4 and this was 4 um, relative to this being 2 by 2, then the magnitude of this uh, mapping function would basically be, you can do the uh, scaling, this would be 4 by 4 equals something uh, 2 by 2. And so the scaling has to be um, a factor of, is it four? Uh, so it's twice as large in one direction, twice as large in the other direction. So I think this is four, right? Yeah, it has to be four. So it's just really the scaling between the relative areas of this. And so it's good to get a, a physical feel for exactly what these components uh, are. And that's important. Um, yeah, okay, that's, yeah, this. So probably we're at uh, as far as we need to go. Um, I will make a couple of closing statements, and that is that uh, we talked about these being serendipity uh, elements. This isn't a very clear slide, but you can see that we can get the shape functions for all of these elements just based on uh, viewing it. So if we wanted to have a two-node element that had nodes one and two only, then the shape functions for that would be exactly this. And we've already used these. Half 1 minus r, half 1 plus r. Those are our basic shape functions. If we want to add a third node to this, then what we need to do is have an extra shape function, which is this. And we need to add an extra term onto these other components so that they actually satisfy the geometry that we're looking at. So these would be the shape functions for a three-noded element, and likewise for a four-noded element. But if we looked at the shape functions for a three-noded element, it's probably instructive to look at what they would look like. Then um, they would look like this. And I'll draw them on top of each other in the same order as they're shown here. And so this is the value of B1. It has to be 1 at the node in question. It has to be 0 at all other nodes. And so B1 will look like, like this.
points. It has to be zero at the mid-side node, it has to go negative and come back up. B2, and actually this is just, this would be exactly what this function is if you plot it out. If you look at B2, it has to be one at node number two, which is this node, and then it has to be zero here, and zero here, and so you can imagine that it goes down like this and comes back up. And so this is uh, positive, this part, this is positive, and this is negative. And the one for uh, the third one, which is B3, uh, has to be one in the middle, unity in the middle, and zero at each end. And so it's actually a parabola. I think it's parabolic, as it goes across here, where this is positive and this is positive. And so you can make these shape functions up. They do have to satisfy this requirement that they have to be one at the node in question and zero at all other nodes in the elements. And so long as they satisfy that, then they're bona fide shape functions that we can use. Um, and that's, uh, you can do the same for the two-dimensional case. Uh, as you saw, when we did the two-dimensional case, the shape functions we used were for the four nodes at the corners, which are these. So in other words, nodes one, two, three, and four, again defined counterclockwise, just for this area calculation. If you wanted to add an extra mid-side node at point five, then you have to add these extra components, including this one, right? You'd have to do this. If you want to add number six, then you'd have to add this extra component here, also include number six. So it's, you just can put them together. So you can almost make them out. And so these mid-side ones start looking a bit like this parabolic one. They have this R squared term in them. And so you can do that for uh, the quadrilateral elements. And if you want to, uh, probably beyond the stuff that we'll talk about here, you can start putting them together for these three-dimensional bricks, which uh, the maximum number of nodes that you could have would be 21 nodes. So for a brick, you have uh, four nodes at the corners on the top, four nodes at the corners on the bottom, so that's eight. You have, uh, I guess you would have how many sides? You have one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So you have 12 mid-side nodes plus the 8 on the corner, which makes 20. And if you put a, a node right in the center of the brick as well, which you can, then you end up with 21 node elements. And it gets a bit complicated, and we won't do that, but that's uh, enough to be able to at least give you a flavor for that. And so it's a bit complicated, I guess, because it ends up with lots of manipulation when you deal with these things in 2D, which is what we've just tried to do. But the principle is relatively straightforward. We want to map from one location to another. We want to be able to define this A matrix, which maps nodal values of head to gradients of head in the global XY coordinate system. And to be able to do that, we have to do a little bit of manipulation, which is really kind of the scaling between the global element and the mapped element. And these uh, determinants of the Jacobian and the Jacobian matrix matrices are merely doing that mapping for us, which allow us to be able to do the integration on a very straightforward uh, bi-unit square and come up with the, the results, which are then used uh, to do the calculations. So we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, so that's really all the stuff that we'll talk about in terms of isoparametric elements. The next material that we'll talk about is how we take this and do not just static flow behavior, but look at transient behavior and how um, flow evolves as a function of time. So maybe take a 10-minute break now. We're five minutes over, but that doesn't matter. And then uh, we'll reconvene.